Hello, and welcome to another episode of Movies, colon, they're pretty good. I'm your host, Travis Dudding, and today I continue my director series, and uh, the director in question today is Paul Thomas Anderson, uh, very, maybe my number one director, uh, he's, he's up there, he's up there, um, and I only like to count like my favorites, uh, when I've seen all of their, you know, feature films. Um, so he's in a select uh, group of directors. It's basically him, Tarantino, Wes Anderson, uh, Mel Brooks, who we covered last week, and uh, David Lynch. So in terms of directing and whole filmographies, that's pretty much it. Um, still missing, uh, at least one Christopher Nolan film, uh, Tenet, still haven't seen that. Uh, I have the Blu-ray, but still haven't watched it. Uh, Kubrick, uh, missing a couple of his older ones, but, uh, yeah, anyways, that's, uh, that's neither here nor there. That doesn't really matter right now. What matters is Paul Thomas Anderson, PTA, the Parent Teacher Association. All right. So, uh, like I said, one of my uh, all time favorite directors. Uh, the first one I saw of his was There Will Be Blood. I saw it at a uh, base theater because my da- I grew up with my dad was in the Navy for twenty years. Uh, I eventually became a veteran myself. I did the air force for eight years. Um, so we had access to the movie theater on the military bases and for a while they were free. Then they were a dollar and then they were always way cheaper, but you just have to wait a little bit till it, uh, had been out of the theater, out of circulation and everything. So, uh, saw that one just a couple months after it had come out uh immediately just fell in like fell in love with it uh fell in love with cinema in general like it it, it was the first movie that i saw that i felt smart after you know which you know everybody has that movie everyone has their phase where they're they feel a little better than everybody and everything like that and you never are you know because everyone's taste is their own taste and nothing nothing you like makes you better than anybody else but you know when you're young when you're 18 17 i i I was 18 when i saw it uh but yeah uh i mean i definitely seen a lot of good movies but this was the first one where it just like blew me away uh and i couldn't put my finger on what i liked about it i just knew that i loved it and wanted to see it again and again and again um so yeah let's uh let's just get right into it let's go back to the beginning uh his first film hard eight uh 1996 uh starring philip baker hall which is he's in a bunch of his movies uh john c Riley also in quite a few um, but then uh, Gwyneth Paltrow and Samuel L. Jackson, and then uh, a, a pretty short cameo appearance from Philip Seymour Hoffman, another PTA mainstay. Uh, great movie. Great, great, great movie. If This is one of the harder ones to find, uh, um, and one of the lesser known ones. Uh, it's about a man who is mentors this young guy that he finds uh he's leaving vegas he was trying to win some money to pay for his mom's funeral um so he decides to take him under his wing and uh kind of teach him how to um make a good amount of money in a short amount of time and also just to like kind of survive in in the casino and just live live in a hotel room pretty much uh um yeah, it just gives them all these tricks of the trade. Uh, this is Philip Baker Hall mentoring John C. Riley. Um, yeah, great, great movie. Uh, I think my favorite Gwyneth Paltrow performance ever. Um, she's did amazing in this. Uh, she is a uh, 
um, a sex worker who marries John C. Riley, and yeah, it's just I I think it's her best performance. Uh, only, eh, yeah, I'd say it's better than Seven because there's more to it, you know, and it's not that her she's a good actress in Seven, but it's like her performance isn't what you're remembering you're just remembering what happens to her you know um so yeah uh really great movie uh give it if you haven't seen that one and seen all the other stuff give it a shot uh i streamed it on pluto tv with ads uh it was so it was free but you just had to watch the same commercial every few minutes but yeah great movie great movie hard eight all right moving on Next, we have, uh, I don't know if it, see, this is where it gets hard because there's really only two that I have rated lower than everything else. And everything else is like a seven way tie, but next is Boogie Nights. And this is, this is one of the best ones, probably one of his best known ones. Uh, incredible, incredible movie. I just watched this, uh, rewatched it today. Um, amazing performances from everybody. Uh, you got Mark Wahlberg and then this is, I, in my opinion, his best acting performance, uh, which so, kind of sucks. Cause he's kind of down on this one and, uh, kind of says that he regrets doing it and stuff because the subject matter of the film boogie nights, if you don't know, is that it's about the porn industry in the 70s and 80s, basically. And it shows, like, the dark side, but also doesn't, like, necessarily say, like, oh, it's all bad, because it does have, like, a happy ending. And um, it's, like, the bad side of, like, what could happen within it and the bad side about how people are going to look down on you, even though you're just trying to make a living, you know. Uh, But, yeah, amazing, amazing performances mark Wahlberg, burt reynolds julianne moore john c Riley, heather graham don Cheadle, philip seymour hoffman uh william h macy uh, Lu- louise guzman melora walter she's another uh repeat pta person uh philip baker hall again alfred molina and he he's probably got my favorite scene in the movie. Uh, he plays a drug dealer that they go to try to rob, and it's one of the most intense scenes, uh, like well done intense scenes, because there's just a lot of tension. It's very chaotic, and you don't really know like what's about to happen. Uh, and that's not the only scene like that. There's another uh, one where. Mark Wahlberg's character, Dirk Diggler, is, like, down on his luck and trying to, like, make money by, like, prostituting himself. And then he gets beat up. And then there's this scene where uh, Don Cheadle uh, has been denied a bank loan because of his career in the porn industry. And so he's just going to pick up some donuts from the donut shop. He goes in there. He's picking them out. Someone tries to rob the donut place and uh, like multiple guns go off and everybody ends up dead except for Don Cheadle. And he just takes the money and, and leaves. <laughs> it's uh, it's an incredible scene. It's uh, I'm saying a lot. I know. Um, yeah, just a great, 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 great movie. And everyone does amazing. Uh Man, I can't recommend that movie enough. But yeah, Boogie Nights. This is this is the one that put Paul Thomas Anderson on the map, pretty much. This is the one that like was his breakout movie and everything. Because people liked Heart 8, but it wasn't like a, a smash success or anything like that. It wasn't a big hit. But Boogie Nights was the one that everyone remembers. And probably because it had someone some big names like Burt Reynolds in there. All right, moving on. We got Magnolia. This one, this one's crazy. This is uh, another all-star cast. Uh, 
You got Philip Baker Hall back again. You got Tom Cruise. You got Philip Seymour Hoffman. You got William H. Macy. You got Julianne Moore back again. John C. Riley back again. Jeez, you got Jason Robards, Melora Walters, Melinda Dillon, uh, Alfred Molina again, Louise Guzman again. Yeah. Yeah, star studded cast. Uh this this is uh this one will hook you in because it's a bunch of different stories that seem disconnected but become connected by the end. Like everything's a little related and you don't realize like until it all like comes together at the end. Um you know, uh popular versions of this but not necessarily good versions of this or stuff like valentine's day and new year's eve and uh, what's that other one um he's just not that into you uh i mean those are all rom-coms but it's a the similar type of thing where they bit off this uh on first appearance, disconnected stories that all like blend at the end. Uh, yeah. And also like a surprisingly feel good movie. And there's like a lot of bad stuff that happens in this and like a lot of dark moments as well. But, uh, and mostly because of the love story between John C. Riley and Melora Walters, it's, it's really like very touching and like, uh, like it's one of my feel good movies. It's one that I'll put on if I'm like feeling kind of down and stuff like that. Uh, it's also a very long movie. I think it's his longest one at a little over three hours, but I had, uh, found this one on TV once and just couldn't stop watching it. You know, I was just flipping channels and I think I, you know, recognized one of the massive stars in the cast and was like, hmm, I'll, I'll check this out and just kept watching and watching and watching. And then, then two and a half hours later, it's <laughs> like, Oh shit. But yeah, real, real good movie. Yep. That's Magnolia from the year 1999. All right. Moving on next. We got punch drunk love. Uh, this is uh, this was probably the first time I heard of uh, a Paul Thomas Anderson movie it, because it was a huge deal in 2002 when Adam Sandler was trying to get into more dramatic roles. And obviously now we know we see him succeed in both. You know, he's making hella money on these comedies that everyone's like a little hard on on netflix but he's making hella money from that uh but then we're also like trying to get him an oscar for uncut gems and stuff like that so we're used to seeing both sides of adam sandler at this point but in 2002 it was it wasn't there wasn't the duality of sandler it was just oh comedy guy going into drama and he's not the first to do that but You know, it they even though it happens all the time, people always make a big deal about it. Um, But this is another like real feel good movie. Uh, Great performance by Adam Sandler. Uh, Love interest is Emily Watson. She does a great job. Philip Seymour Hoffman, kind of the antagonist. Uh, You got Louise Guzman, Marilyn Rice Cub. Robert Smigel, the uh, SNL writer, he's got a cameo in there. Yeah, a uh, bunch of other like small cameo parts from different comedians and stuff like that. But it's a real good, real good story, real beautiful love story, um, and also funny too. Like it, it's obviously like way more dramatic than uh, Sandler's other stuff at that time, but very funny as well you know and it kind of just lives in this realm of acceptance of people with different uh, mental states and things like that because adam sandler suffers from 
kind of he's like very socially awkward and a little bit of an anchor management and things like that and like his family's like always super down on him and everything like that but he's also very successful too so it's not like you know he's completely he's not like a complete failure or anything like that not that anyone ever is but um yeah just real real beautiful movie uh another another feel good one I'll put on it's the only one that is on Criterion collection uh which I'm hoping that changes I know Boogie Nights was uh in the laser disc days but uh so I'm hoping someday they go ahead and put that on 4K or Blu-ray Criterion collection cuz I mean I mean, all these movies belong, but I know it's just always stupid rights issues and stuff like that. And, uh, I mean, newsflash, the studios suck, so who knew? All right. Moving on. Next, we got There Will Be Blood. Like I said before, this was my first Paul Thomas Anderson movie. Uh, I think my favorite, but it's... Like I said, it's very hard to decide to pick a favorite. I'm going to try at the end. I'm going to try to rank them all in real time. So bear with me through that. Um, But There Will Be Blood. This is the first time he works with uh, Daniel Day-Lewis. First of two times. Uh, Very different movie like from the other ones so far. The other ones are very big. Um like I said, star-studded casts, a lot going on, a lot of plot going on. This is not a plot-driven movie. Um, I mean, there is a plot, but this is definitely character-based cinema. Um, This, if you want to look at uh, perfect acting, Daniel Day-Lewis and There Will Be Blood. I mean, he did win the Oscar for it, so no surprise there. Um, but just, I want to say like the first 20 to 30 minutes, there's, uh, only one word of dialogue and it's just, but even with that, and it's just a couple scenes of him, uh, mining for gold, getting injured, crawling to town to get the money, buying land and, drilling for oil and even even in those scenes there's not really any dialogue and you're still just captivated the whole time it's literally just a guy in the desert trying to get oil and but you're glued to the tv to the screen whatever wherever you're watching it um but yeah daniel day lewis uh paul dano uh he plays uh this small town revival, like tent revival style preacher. Uh, also an incredible, incredible performance. Uh, Kevin J. O'Connor. He's been in a few things. He'll be in a couple more. Uh, Paul Thomas Anderson movies uh, coming up. I think the next one, uh, Kieran Hines, uh, then a couple like random uh, cameos from different comedians like Paul F. Tompkins. He's got a small part in there. Uh, but yeah, this, uh, like I said, it's about an oil tycoon. Um, underlying theme is just greed in general. Like, I don't want to give away the ending for anyone that happens to not have seen this movie. If you haven't, like, it. Honestly, like the only one that I wouldn't flat out recommend of this of Paul Thomas Anderson's whole filmography is Inherent Vice. But I've only seen it the one time and I feel like if I give it another chance, uh, I might like it this time, you know, because I've definitely. uh, I've definitely appreciated some of the movies more on a second view. Some of them were five stars right off the bat, and then a couple of them were like, I don't know about that, and then I watch it again, and like, oh my god, this is amazing. Uh, But I haven't done that yet with Inherent Vice, but like I said, all these movies, highly recommend them. Go watch them if you haven't. 
uh, yeah, there will be blood. Just oh, maybe one of the few perfect movies. Um, all right, moving on. Uh, the Master. Now, this is one that I uh, wasn't completely sold on the first time I saw it. Uh, but got to tell you, watched rewatched it last night. Oof. Yeah, this is another like full on master class of acting right here and it's not just daniel day lewis like in there will be blood it's literally the whole cast is just putting on 150 percent you got um joaquin phoenix is the main character uh you got philip seymour hoffman he plays the uh leader of this religious cult it's very like I mean, everyone was like, oh, the guy that made There Will Be Bloods making a Scientology movie. It's not fully Scientology, but it's <laughs> it's pretty much Scientology. Uh, so, yeah, he he plays basically the L. Ron Hubbard of this uh, this cult in The Master. Did I even say the title? The Master. Ugh. Yeah, uh, my brain's like all over the place right now. But so <laughs> just bear with me. I know I'm like probably getting pretty rambly. Uh, you got Amy Adams uh, plays uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's wife. Uh, Rami Malek, Laura Dern, Jesse Plemons. Uh, Kevin J. O'Connor's back again for this one. Uh, yeah, and then just a few other. Um, you know, he always gets his comedian friends in there. You got Julian Bell in this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this one, uh, it's another one of those that's just very captivating. There's definitely a lot more plot going on in this one than there will be blood. Uh, and it's just, I don't know. Like, I know I'm just saying like the same things about all these different movies, but it's just powerhouse performance after powerhouse performance and then even if you took all the acting out of it you have some of the most beautiful shots like ever put on on the screen uh i my personal favorite it's like pretty early on in the movie uh um, because joaquin phoenix's character is a war veteran this is right after world war ii it, that this is taking place and uh there's this shot of him on a where he's like hanging or not kind of hanging, but like just laying down like up high on a naval ship. And you could just see the ship, like the waves going like amongst the, the ship. And it's just a downward shot of him, you know, and it, there's no way I could explain it and do justice. Uh, but like when you see it, you'll know, cause it's just incredible. Um, but yeah, this beautifully shot film, great music. And that's another thing. A lot of the soundtracks uh, done by Johnny Greenwood uh, from Radiohead. Uh, but he is an amazing composer. And I think for me personally, and I'll get into it more later on in the episode. But to me, the mark of a good score for a movie is if you're like humming it on the way home you know or just later that day after you watch it say if you did watch it at home you just can't get that score out of your head and that's like that only happens with a few and it's you know it's easy now when you were born in 89 and just grew up with Star Wars to be like, oh, that score is so iconic. Because it is. Because it was already iconic by the time you had ears and could identify stuff. You know? But, so it's a lot harder now to be like, oh, like that that score is so amazing. Because you don't know if it's going to have that staying power. Um, and so I think if... if you can't get like those like melodies out of your head. Um, then I think then you got a good, you got a good film score, you know, and the master definitely has a great score. Um, 
harder to pinpoint the like good parts of the score in there will be blood because it's a very minimalist score um but when we get to phantom thread i'll uh, talk more about that uh, and I probably, I might've mentioned it in the Phantom Thread episode, but if I didn't, or if I did, either way, I'm gonna, <laughs> gonna be reiterating. That's basically the, that should be the title of this episode. Travis reiterates everything he's ever said. Um, all right, next we come to my least favorite, but still probably a pretty good movie, Inherent Vice. You got... Uh, Joaquin Phoenix is back. You got Josh Brolin. You got Owen Wilson. You got Catherine Waterston, Reese Witherspoon, Benicio del Toro, Jenna Malone, Joanna Newsom. Oh man, uh, Hong Chow. She was just nominated. Uh, you got Paul Thomas Anderson's wife, Maya Rudolph. Uh, Michael Kenneth Williams. That's Omar from The Wire. Uh, Martin Short. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure a bunch more. This one uh, takes place in the 70s. Uh, just Joaquin Phoenix is a detective who is, you know, on drugs because it's the 70s. And uh, he's investigating the disappearance of an ex-girlfriend, basically. Um, like I said, I've only seen it the one time. Uh, it's visually very cool, you know. That's great visuals, uh, which is the case for all of these movies. But uh, don't remember much about the plot is, you know, at least in my opinion, after one viewing, pretty forgettable. Nothing's really sticking out to me other than how good it looked, you know. But like I said, I'll give it another shot and maybe I'll update you guys when I do. Maybe I'll like, oh, this is actually his best movie and do an episode on it. But, you know, not holding my breath. So moving on from Inherent Vice to Phantom Thread. Uh now not gonna uh talk too much about the movie because I already did an ep full episode on it, but uh, probably my other, the one I'm back and forth between There Will Be Blood and this, which shows you how powerful Daniel Day-Lewis is, because those are the two movies that he's in, and those are the two that are in contention for which one's my favorite. Uh, amazing movie. Now, uh, what I was saying about the score, uh, that, um, that Phantom Thread theme is just incredible. Like, oh man, it's, I, that's, I, I just couldn't get it out of my head. I was thinking about it like all the time. I downloaded the soundtrack. I'm always looking for it on uh, vinyl. I'd love to have the record of it. I probably, I, at one point on my Spotify, uh, wrapped, uh, Johnny Greenwood was number one just cause I kept like listening to the Phantom Thread soundtrack when I was going to sleep. So, uh, yeah, amazing, amazing score on that. Uh, just finished watching, rewatching that before I recorded, uh, just cause I wanted to get in that headspace of Paul Thomas Anderson and everything. Um, yeah, but oh, man, just such a good movie. Um, oh, so now we come to his most recent one. And this one's a pretty divisive one, um, even with me, because the first time I watched it, uh, wasn't sure like how I felt about it, but I also just had like a really bad, no, not like really bad, but, um, just a, a difficult viewing experience of it. I'm not going to go into details on that, but, uh, so licorice pizza, um, I, uh, like I said, first time didn't really know how I felt about it, but also the, it wasn't an ideal viewing situation. Watched it again yesterday, uh, or well, over the co course of a few days cause it was on Amazon and, uh, yeah, loved it a lot more this time. Uh, appreciate it a lot more. Uh, I'm still not a hundred percent sure how I feel about the plot because that's, uh, it's about a young child actor and by child actor, I mean 15, um, but still a child, uh, who falls in love with this like girl in her twenties played by, uh, Himes, uh, is it Alana Heim? Yeah. 
Alana Heim, uh, and the the other Heim sisters are in there too. Uh, but um, he's in love with this girl in her twenties, and there's this huge age gap, and it's they don't make it too weird, but what's bothersome about it is the fact that if if the if the genders were reversed everyone would definitely have a problem with it so that's just basically and maybe that was the whole point of it is like to be make everyone examine their own prejudices and like oh look how you're okay with that but like should you be i don't know maybe i'm looking way too into it but uh if you don't think about that too much. Uh, it's a really good movie. It's really funny. It looks great. Uh, another great score. It's taken place in the 70s. Um, it's all like in the valley. It's in San Fernando Valley. Uh, so a lot of great location shots if you uh, are from that area or familiar with that area. Um, great. It, it's great. It's really fun. It's a lot of good jokes too. Um I think one of my favorite things about it, though, is that the main character, uh, Gary Valentine, is played by Cooper Hoffman, who is Philip Seymour Hoffman's son. And, uh, man, and he is incredible. And it's like, it's one of those things that when you, if you think about it while you're watching him, like, be this amazing actor, just like his dad was, then it, it can be, like, a little emotional. Because it's like, oh, man... Like we lost Philip Seymour Hoffman, obviously, but look, look how good his son is too. I'm not saying that that makes it, you know, everything fine. And it's like, oh, we don't need him because we have a son. That's not what I mean. Um, I just mean like, he's just so incredible. And it just makes me, it made me smile to see that his son's out there doing just as good as him, you know, and I hope he does have a, long career if that's what he wants you know maybe he just wanted to do this one because a lot of like the there's a lot of cameos from nepo babies in this movie and i think that's kind of you know (laughs) part of it but yeah great 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 movie uh little little weird the more you think about it but still very enjoyable and it's like so enjoyable that it's easy to forget like what what else is going on um yeah so yeah that's the career of paul thomas anderson looking forward to whatever else he has uh coming up uh so let's go ahead and rank these um i'm gonna say least favorite i already said inherent vice um next i'll put punch drunk love uh that might go up after a rewatch but because it's been a long time since I've watched that one. Uh, But right now I'm feeling like that's second to last, but I love that one. So what does that tell you about this guy's career? You know, Um, next, I think I'll go hard eight. Then licorice pizza. The Master, Magnolia, Boogie Nights, Phantom Thread, and number one, There Will Be Blood. Yeah. Okay. So that is my definitive ranking for now. As of 2023, November 2023, uh, that is my ranking of the Paul Thomas Anderson movies. All right. So... Thank you guys for listening. Uh, I hope it wasn't too uh, rambly or incoherent. And I hope I gave you any sort of like meritable (laughs) information. Uh, I hope it was fun to listen to at least. Uh, I'll be way more prepared for the next one, I think. Uh, But yeah, it's just... uh, favorite or one of my favorite directors uh love his work can't wait to see what he has next uh can't wait to revisit some of those ones that i wasn't sure how i felt about and that is it for me uh follow me at or follow the show 
at movies they're pretty good with no punctuation on instagram uh that's where i'm the most active uh gonna do two more of these director episodes uh i'll have a special guest on uh, one of them. I don't know if it's going to be the next episode or the last one of the month. And then once December hits, I'll be doing some holiday movies, uh, probably mostly Christmas ones, uh, just cause that's the, the winter holiday that I celebrate. Uh, but, um, yeah, that's, that's it. So, uh, Stick around. Uh, hope you enjoyed the episode. Hope you were enjoying the show, even if you didn't enjoy this episode. And see you next week. Thanks. Bye.